So, over the Christmas holidays, I spent an obscene amount of time absorbed by a brand new Elder Scrolls experience, one where I could restore the Kingdom of the Reach with a sword of a Daedric Prince and a summoned army of Dramora, preside over the Protectorate of the Imperial City with a dynasty of stewards until riches were so vast that I could reunite Cyrodiil with a militaristic descendant, create a lineage of vampires manipulating politics from the shadows, or simply live as an elven scholar on an island and cultivate a family of researchers. I have brought fame to my dynasty and removed others from the face of Nern. Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott and this is The Elder Kings 2. There may be a good chance that you are unfamiliar with this game if your typical fare is open world RPGs. Well, this game is actually Crusader Kings 3, but Elder Kings 2 is a complete overhaul mod with so much detail that it may as well be considered its own game. Elder Kings 2 released in November last year and it allows you to play in the tumultuous period that is the mid-second era as any character you like. The creative expansions of the lore are amazing, the attention to detail is fantastic and there are so many sensational choices when it comes to building your character, who let me remind you will be the founder of your dynasty. There are thousands of potential options in terms of race, you can be the classic suite of Elder Scrolls playable races, Ultima, Bosma, Breton, Argonian, Khajiit, Redguard, Dunman, Nord, Orc and Imperial, but you can also be a Goblin, Marima, Falma, Reekling, Dramora, Aelid, Lilmuthit, those obscure fox people, several needic ethnicities such as the silver-skinned Kothringi, Wali, Orma, and Yesbest, and you can even play the Sayesi, the snake-like Akaviri people who served the Riemann Emperors until their demise and then continued to rule as potentates. And honestly, that just covers the general racial ideas, but of course, race and culture are not necessarily connected, and the same goes for religion. You'll have the Dereni Elves of Balfiera who try to re-extend their grip over the populace of High Rock, the Oridoni of Somerset who value the scholarly pursuits most, or you have the divides between the Stridents of the Abakian, the Colovians, the Heartlanders, and the Nibonese, all different cultural variations of the Imperials. As a fan of the older interpretations of the lore, where Nibonae was a region of jungle and floodplains, this excites me to no end. They even gave the Nibonese varied face tattoos to go along with their sorcerous ways and Nibonese battle mages. Also in this region, you have the Nibonu culture, which is like the Nibonese, but without the Imperial refinement, and much closer to the traditional Nidic roots. For example, many of them are part of the Thousand Cults religion, and they actually speak Old Syrid, which I imagine is like speaking Old English for us, a language without the thousand plus years of Latin influences. Same goes here. And yeah, there's languages which you can learn to increase your perception among foreign powers, and you can even create hybrid cultures. I should clarify now that this game is huge. There is so much potential and so many systems that interlock and crisscross and deliver so many unique experience, so it's hard to not overload you with information, but bear with me a little bit longer. Your character has skills in diplomacy, martial, stewardship, intrigue, learning, and the arcane. There is magic, you can summon armies of Daedra, raise dead, charm your opponents with illusion, mend your wounds and lift curses, summon yourself some bound armor. Religions and the mythology of the Elder Scrolls is one of my favorite parts, and Elder Kings 2 has delivered. There are so many religions to pick from. You have your classic imperial cult and similar but geographical versions such as the Nordic Pantheon, the Breton Rite, and the Faith of the Forebears. There are cults for every single Daedric Prince and even more obscure things like the Dawn Court Akaviri Faith, or among the Reachmen things such as Hagraven Cults, Duema Idolatry, Minotaur Cults, the Druidark Cult, or Worship of the Old Gods. There is the religion of the Skull. There's even more obscure things like the Glenmoral Weird, where witchhood is a virtue. Oh, and the hundreds of unique traits you can get. You can be a witch, a lich, a necromancer, a vampire, lustful or chaste, wrathful or generous. You can even go play Harkin if you like. You can spend tens of hours just exploring the customization menu, but let's start a little more grounded and introduce you to the actual setting. The Elder Kings 2 is set in the mid-second era and you can choose two main time periods, 440 or 450 of the second era, both of which are set over 100 years before before the Elder Scrolls Online and provides a bunch of different world states and characters to choose from, but there will be no plain meld and no Ebonheart Pact, and the fate of Tamriel from here is up to you. But in terms of setting, Tamriel is fractured politically and will only fracture more, or perhaps not with you at the helm, who knows. 
The core conflict of Cyrodiil in 440 is that the grandson of Savrian Chorak is ruling over the death throes of the Cyrodiilic potentate while a warlord named Atribus from Coral has united the Clovian estates and set forth on a campaign to rid Cyrodiil of Saesi rule, and the outcomes in your playthrough are varied even without playing as the characters. Sometimes Atribus takes over for a time, in other playthroughs the potentate stays strong. In the north, Skyrim is divided into east and west with two high kings and almost every place on the map is experiencing some kind of fracturing and transition. Now, the game gives you plenty of recommended start options, showing you off characters and providing context for their stories and the situation that is ongoing. One of my favorite areas is actually the Topol Bay, aka the Sea of of troubles. With the Potentate crumbling in the northern Nibbin, Leowen has built bridges to control all trade in and out of the Nibbin Valley, and this has given them a great opportunity for wealth, yet also put quite the target on their back. To the west, the Malapit Khajiit are entrenched, and to the east, War Lady Fabiana seeks to align with the Yespest and kick in the Overlord's teeth. Speaking of which, one of my favorite expansions on the lore is the Yespest. In the actual Elder Scrolls lore, they are simply a Nidic tribe of Black Marsh with little information. But Elder Kings has made the Yespest a Nidic tribe with a unique culture and religion. They are a race of men that have adopted the aesthetic styles of the Aelid Elves, and they also have a tendency towards their Daedric worship. Their faith is that of the Sanguine Mysteries, a faith born of apathy and a yearning for comfort. They worship Sanguine, the Prince of Revelry, in three aspects, of the birth, of the feast, and of the wild. Their adherents separate into groups devoted to a single aspect and practice in total secrecy from everyone else in special isolated places called sanguinariums. Breaking the oath of mystery is a serious taboo. Worship is not done in prayer, but in act, honoring sanguine with lavish feasts and generous gestures. It's a religion of compassionate hedonism. Honestly, Black Marsh in general is one of the most eclectic mixes of culture and religion on the map, which makes for quite an interesting playthrough. And to give you an idea of how the game plays, I'm going to show you a great run I had with Morillier, the Arana of Loriazel. Descended from a venerable line of Barsabic Aelid kings, we will seek to restore the Aelids to true power. Now, five years ago, Silianorn fell to the Dunmar, Silianorn being the Aelid name for Stormhold. And this has put Morillier in a difficult position surrounded by hostile Cothringi and Argonian tribes, along with the Dunmar to the north. We are going to have to do some busy work to rebuild strength in our kingdom. Morillier is an Aelid, more specifically, specifically of the Barsabic culture, which was a group of Aelids that left to Black Marsh after an event known as the Narfinsel Schism. Essentially, the Barsabic Aelids didn't like the worship of Daedra among the Aelid culture of Cyrodiil, and so after a climax of a civil war, the Barsabics lost and had to make their new home in Black Marsh, where they would only worship the Aedra. Speaking of which, our religion is Malada, which is the Aelid variation of the Aldmeri faith. So they venerate Oriel and Trinimac and so on, but with a lot more human sacrifice and war priests. Our character is 100 years old, which is not that old for an elf, and we have the lifespan 3 trait, which means we should live into our mid-200s, and as a female we'll become infertile around 160 years of age. And there are other variations of this lifespan trait, 1, 2, 3, and 4, all of which give very life extensions. You may even as a human have a child with a Bosma and end up with a human kid with vague Bosma features and a lifespan that will take them to year 120. That's another thing I like about this game, the realistic crossbreeding. In traditional Elder Scrolls lore, we're given a rather contrived reasoning in the book Racial Phylogeny for the non-existence of half-breed races, claiming that the race of the mother determines the child's race. But in Elder Kings 2, men and elves can mix freely and you can get some really cool combinations, but also also some quite scary combinations. I had a Reachman warlord whose grandfather was an orc and, well, imagine a human with an orcish tusked mouth. But to me it's far more exciting to see all these mixed features and unique lineages and it just brings far more flavour to your dynasties. Anyways, back to Morillier. She is a steward through and through. Her education trait is the rank 3 for stewardship, meaning our perk progress in that lifestyle will increase 30% faster and we have secondarily got a pretty good learning and arcane skill. Being 100 years old, our character has already advanced quite a bit through the stewardship tree and we have the administrator and very useful architect capstone traits unlocked. These perks will allow us to build for cheaper and faster, helping us build up our realm for economic production. That I think is going to 
be the core playstyle of this character for a while. We're going to have to play tall and expand only slightly every now and then and spend lots of time focused on building up a very secure, culturally and religiously aligned base of vast economic productivity before we start aspiring to mass expansion. But look, to start a dynasty, we kind of need a husband. It takes two to tango, but uh, apparently since there are so few options of worthy suitors here in Loriesel, and we definitely want a matrilineal marriage to continue our dynasty line, we, uh, we might have to marry our cousin. I don't want to incur the prestige hit for marrying a lowborn, and I suppose this fits the whole pure-blooded Aelid theme for a playthrough. So this is my cousin and husband, Varendil Carindol. Hopefully we'll start getting some babies soon and have an heir. So that's done, and we've assigned our council to their positions and jobs, and we have our steward assisting development in the capital. We will go on a pilgrimage to get ourselves the pilgrim trait and earn ourselves some more monthly piety, but to get that piety boosted, let's raid our Kothringi neighbors for some captives so that we can sacrifice them to the gods. Oh, and I was pregnant, a newborn son, and my husband has suggested we name him after my father, Ormamir. Lovely idea. I'm going to personally educate the child so I will be able to intervene and guide him towards developing certain personality traits that I find desirable in an heir. And we won the raid so we get a host of captives. Time to sacrifice these silver-skinned tribals to the Aldmeri gods, earning us a good chunk of piety. I'm the good guy, right? Marriage is a political affair, but you can seduce and romance your spouse, which seems to increase the frequency of children, and in general, I feel like it's a good idea to enjoy your spouse's company. We're going to start building farms and other bits of infrastructure in our holdings with every bit of spare gold we have. Oh, another son. Let's name him after my husband's father, Kenadelon. We are working on the magical arts lifestyle, focusing first on alteration, because there are some very useful rituals to use which increase our army movement speed and protection. We will do a little more raid Oh, and another child, Untamir. Because we have the diligent trait, we can increase development in our capital, but at the cost of stress, and we reached stress level one. Time to cope. I think we're going to pick Flagellant, which allows us to essentially whip ourselves bloody to ease the stress of life each time we gain the trait wounded, but we have restoration magic and a good court physician, so we should be fine. Okay, fast forward a little bit, time to expand a little, and we're going to try and conquer the county of Sul. We outnumber them, and they are ruled currently by a child. Should be easy pickings. Oh. Our son, Ormamir, got into a scuffle. I could intervene and guide him towards other traits for the cost of stress, but uh, nah, he can keep the brave trait. And we win the war and Sol is now ours. We have an available dynasty legacy, and these are like perks, but apply to your whole dynasty. We're going to pick Noble Veins, giving us 30% bonus to our chance of inheriting good congenital traits, and 30% more chance of a completely new good congenital trait. By the way, I keep using the Learn Language scheme on everyone around me, so I can learn Kothringi, Gel, Cyrodiilic, etc. and so on. Always good to understand my enemy's tongue. After all, I do plan on ruling them one day. Okay, so we've conquered Arx Carinium County and our lands are a little bit bigger. We have our priest working on converting the faith of the regions and some physical injuries have been incurred by our family in the fighting against the Kothringi tribes. My husband, Varendil, has lost an eye and well, our son, our poor son, is now both one-legged and gruesomely disfigured and so he wears this mask. But we actually need to find him a spouse now, so uh, Gothilma it is. I I forgot to mention, our fourth son was born and now he, Garamir, has come of age. I'm going to fast forward the clock a little more. We're finished with magic for the time being and we're going to dive into the learning lifestyle tree, especially considering we are the cultural head of our culture. The scientific perk will be useful, increasing our cultural fascination progress speed by 35%, which essentially means we are getting more useful unlocks sooner. Damn, outlived my second child. Kenadelon was murdered. Might be a good idea to head down the Hall of Body Tree in learning and squeeze as much life out of this character as I can. Also, let's expand a little further and retake the lands of Silyanorn. Oh no. Our brave Aaron Varandil was killed leading an attack against the Mazatun skirmishers. He was slain by Nalvina, Pelon of High Ordinator Evo, in a fierce encounter. That is pretty tragic. 121 years of marriage is over. We lost the battle and we're going to have to try again another day. 
Several years later, we are now in a romance with our realm priest and conquering the Argonians. We now have enough de jure counties to create the Kingdom of Shadowfen, or in the Aelid tongue, the Arancel of Silyanorn. Over 150 years after our father was killed and we lost Silyanorn, we have reforged the kingdom and we now have access to a royal court where we can hear petitioners and show off our cool relics. Fast forward and we have the option to found a holy order, which is essentially an army of knights devoted to the religion and that you can hire for some piety or if you're the founder you can hire for free very helpful and uh, <laughs> we have the option to found the lordship of stay moist Argonians and their names I just can't resist. With your support, the Knight Paladin Malion has founded the Malada faithful of stay moist nice Okay, the year is 599 of the Second Era and we are slowly expanding, but wow, look at Cyrodiil. Chaden Hall has conquered Breville and Leowen. Overlady Aventia, 81 years old, and she looks like that. Somehow she has the Lifespan 3 trait. Oh, look, her father was an elf. She is bordering my territory and I don't like that. By the way, I have absolutely lost the plot with my dynasty. I have so many grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren, it's really hard to keep track of who is who. I really like my great-great-granddaughter, Amtherasaya, and she has good traits and a rank 4 lifespan and good skills. She is of my eldest line, but I think I'm going to have to be a bit of a dog and disinherit my other great-granddaughter so that Amtherasaya would eventually inherit instead. It's all right, Grandma will give you some money because she feels bad. <laughs> also, since we've done the learning and steward trees, let's do some martial lifestyle stuff as we start expanding more aggressively, conquering more lizard people. We need more land to farm. Tragedy strikes, my son and heir, Ormamir, is slain in the Battle of Broken Tusk. To be honest, it's kind of crazy that he being one-legged and gruesomely disfigured continue to fight in battle at all. My new heir is then Lamedana, my granddaughter, and the day has come. Overlady Aventia of Chaden Hall has declared war against me, simply over the claim of one county of Pantherfang, with a superior force of 47,500. Uh-oh. We're gonna need to use the map strategically for this one. Our army numbers probably half of their number. A big show of numbers has scared off one of their armies to seek another way in. We should hire some mercenaries to protect other areas of our border. Oh, and they've come, trying to cross over the pass at Mazaton. The idiot split her army so we can take the full strength of ours and engage. Yes, we caught them on the move and victory at the Battle of Chukmont. Now to handle the other half, easy win and the enemy armies are in retreat, but they will be back. Time to resupply and reorganize. Okay. She didn't learn. Her armies are even more split than before, allowing us to clean up easy, and we won the two battles of Black Spring. Time to handle the rest of her scattered army sieging my realm. We retake Panthermouth and declare victory. Now, this is a pretty peak moment. We successfully thwart the invasion of Overlady Aventia. We are safe for now. Time to get back to our own expansion. Overlady Aventia is conquering deep into Black Marsh and we need to gobble up as much territory as we can to compete. Which we do for a while, but then Aventia comes back for round two. But this time we are far more evenly matched and in summary we give her wrecked part two. Oof, she has to pay me over 4k for the shame. Anyways, I'm a scheme to murder her and hopefully with partition laws her realm breaks up. Uh oh, poisoned wine. Cheers, Queen Aventia. That chopped it up a little. Lewin and Mirkwood are both free now. Let's repeat the process with her heir and see if we can screw them over even more. And her heir, Queen Vichia, also bites the dust and that looks much better. Now we have no consolidated power bordering us. Instead, it's been fractured greatly. Fantastic. Our expansion in Black Marsh should now be relatively unchecked. Oh, and yeah, my granddaughter, Lamedana, also died. And my great-granddaughter, Gulada, child of Lamada, died before. And so my desired heir, Amtherasaya, is next in line. It's actually pretty crazy. Because of my investment into the learning whole of body perk tree line, I'm actually 317 years old right now. Pretty nuts. 
Fast forward to the year 666 of the Second Era and I have conquered enough de jure counties to create the title of High Kingdom of Argonia. So now we have a rank that is an Empire tier and so we can give Kingdom ranks to our descendants safely without risking fracturing into several independent kingdoms. Okay, now we can really start the aggressive play where we are conquering Leywan so we can choke the rest of Cyrodiil. Now that's easy, done, time to attack House Stress and try to incorporate the realm of Tearmarsh into our domain. Unfortunately, we lost our heir, Rip Amathera Sire, and so our new heir is her son. House Stress is in tatters. We can't quite make Tearmarsh ours yet, but soon. You know what, let's just toast Breville. And you know what, while we're at it and we still have our beast character kicking in her final years, let's toast House Lalu as well. Nice. We're gonna have to fight Inderil for those last little bits of Tearmarsh and just like that, bam, we have brought the region of Tearmarsh into the Kingdom of Argonia. Argonia is looking quite big on the map and our faith is spreading far, but to truly restore the Aelid Kingdom, we need our ancient seat of power and that is owned by Lord Protector Nasidius of the Heartlands. Let's get to conquering and take the White Gold Tower. We double his numbers, plus we get mercs to make sure the job is done right and bingo the heartlands are ours time to move our capital to the white gold tower look at me 360 years old sitting atop the ruby throne an ailed queen but alas this is the chair i will die on in but a year it is the 701st year of the second era and malrana morilier caradol who reigned for 261 years took the tiny, broken hold of Loriesel and over her reign, reclaimed Cillianorn, fought the powers of Cyrodiil, united the High Kingdom of Blackmarsh, conquered most of Nibine, and finally, before her long-awaited death, she conquered the Heartlands and sat on her ancestral seat, the ruby throne of the White Gold Tower. Now, it has fallen to her descendant, Maloran Lethalel, to continue her legacy, consolidate Cyrodiil, and perhaps expand the Aela domain over all of Dawn's beauty. But that, perhaps, is for another time. I have had so much fun with this game and there are so many unique playthroughs and experiences to have, not only in what you do, but what other powers do. In one playthrough, I saw House Telvanni conquer Solitude and half of Western Skyrim, which in turn converted half of the local Nords to the faith of the Tribunal Temple. Some crazy stuff can happen, and if you do decide this interests you, it is simple as buying the game Crusader Kings 3 and going to the Steam Workshop and downloading Elder Kings 2. I want to give you a huge thank you to the wonderful and talented modders who have put so much work and love into this mod, and I hope this video can play some part in getting it the attention it deserves. Like the video, share it around, subscribe for more Elder Scrolls content. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.